It's not entirely an event about Lou. I think that he's always sort of in the background of it. Um, what I want to spend this time talking about is, uh, you know, Lou Sullivan's life and what it has been like for me as a trans archivist, as well as my friend Francis, who is um, an, an archivist volunteer, mm -hmm. um, to work with these collections that have so much connection to our, our own history, as well as the history of uh, the various folks who have come before us. Um, I, I've also invited Ms. Bob Davis to talk about the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive. And uh, lastly, um, of, of course, uh, Ellis Martin and uh, Zach Osma to read from their collection of Lou Sullivan's diaries. We both laughed in pleasure. It's very tricky and complicated to talk about archiving trans material when so often trans people are folks who have been let down by various institutions throughout our lives. I don't want to be part of an institution that continues to let down trans people after our deaths. And so I think it's very important to have more than anything a public conversation. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is just talk very briefly about Lou Sullivan, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with him. I, I suspect that a lot of you are. But um, uh, Lou Sullivan lived between, I, I think, 1951 and uh, 1991. And uh, he was a gay trans man who was uh, born in the Midwest and uh, died in San Francisco. Um, he was one of the founding members of the GOBT Historical Society and uh, all of his materials are at GLBTHS. Uh, not only his diaries, which are voluminous and uh, well-known, and of course, are now a cool book, but also his subject files, um, his extensive research on the history of transmasculinity, and um, all of the different names that the urge to, um, and the, the deeply seated desire to live as a man um, all of the names that that has worn over the years, because of course it's had many. Um, his own research uh, about that, about Jackie Garland. Um, his VHS collection is there. His, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the small books that he kept to keep track of his medication regimen when he was dying of AIDS are there. And uh, it's a very complete record of a human life, and it's one that I treasure, I think, more than any other collection that we have. Um, I think that when I think about Lou, um, it's a collection that's very human, and it's a collection that's very personal, and uh, like in some ways very cranky. You know, he was um, who, someone who I think of as having a very sunny disposition, but also who needed to get what he wanted and asked for it and got it. You know, it was very difficult to be a trans man at the time, it's difficult today. It was harder to be a queer one at the time. It remains hard today. And uh, it was something that required him to be a strong person as well. But um, yeah, I, I think that his, uh, his, his sort of spirit and his frustration with the world and his desire to build the world that he wanted to see among other things, through the medium of historical research and telling trans stories. That comes through very much in his collection. Um, it's also a very sexy collection. Uh, the diaries have uh, lots of uh, details about his romantic and sexual life. And um, I, I think that thinking about the sexiness of Lou's collection uh, leads into part of what I want to talk about in the next little bit of the program, which is my conversation with Francis, which is, um, the, the question of consent in archives and how so many of the things that make that Lou brings up for me uh, revolve around consent, especially um, his consent to be in the collection, you know, his, his desire to have his papers kept at GLBTHS. Um, whether the people whose um, correspondence he maintains could meaningfully consent to be present in the archives whether they should be named, whether they've agreed to that, uh, whether they've de facto agreed to do that. And uh, also just a variety of other questions about whether you agree to be remembered uh, or whether you would prefer something else and how we can possibly know. And uh, so uh, Francis, if it's okay, if you wanna come up and we're just gonna talk for a few minutes. Um, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Francis, who is my friend and a super cool person. Um, uh, Francis is a scientist by training and computer wrangler by trade, with interests that have covered fiber arts, dance, 
martial arts, trauma embodiment, maker spaces, free software and open knowledge, and other kinds of knowledge sharing mutual support. Francis spends possibly too much time reading about queer slash trans anything in a long shot attempt to make gender and sexuality add up to something remotely coherent. So, thank you. My involvement with um, GLBT just started, started with um, this collection. They were looking for a volunteer to basically go through um, update what they call the finding aid, so the thing that tells researchers more or less what's in there and whether it's something that they might be interested in or that might be relevant to something that they want to, that they might want to be looking for or want to see. And also just sort of going through it and making sure that nothing had gone wandering because collections that get used don't always get put back in order. Yeah. And this, this collection, um, it, it was donated in 1991, soon after Lou died. And uh, so it's had a lot of time to potentially wander, get out of order, and, and also fall victim to um, uh, just entropy. Um, I've been really happy to report that as Francis has been exploring the collection, um, there's been less entropy than I expected, which is a very rare experience um, in human life. Um, <laughs> so what uh, ethical issues have come up in, in the work that we've been doing together? Uh, I think that the main one that I wanted to talk about in, in front of uh, the group right now um, revolves around names, and uh, specifically names that come up in Lou's correspondence. Yeah, so one of, one of the fascinating parts of the collection is um, one of the really wonderful things that Lou did over the course of his life was sort of try to be a connection connection point for other trans men, FDMs, trans masculine folks, however you want to um, however however you want to name that set of experiences. So he was also a secretary by trade, so he was really good at keeping tabs on everything, following up, writing draft notes, so a lot of the correspondence doesn't just have what they sent, it has his drafts of what he was gonna send. So all of that adds up to, um, I don't know, like a couple of dozen folders, would you say, of varying correspondence of varying lengths. Ranges from like a note or two, um, you know, here's some resources, to like an eight year correspondence with, um, with other trans men. And people would find him through all sorts of uh, avenues. Um, he published a booklet of information for, um, let's see, I wonder if I can name it, it has a very long title, Information for the Female to Male Crossdresser and Transsexual. And uh, people would uh, write asking for copies, um, and they would contact him after finding it. And uh, he also was a volunteer counselor at the Janus Information Facility, uh, which published the book. So, um, and as Francis was saying, uh, some of the correspondence is brief, some of it is really extended. Uh, some of these people became his friends, um, and they would change, you know, over the course of this long conversation. Um, the people would change names. Uh, they would change. They would change how they identified. Um, they would just describe themselves in in different ways. Um, description is, by the way, a really resonant term for an archivist because arrangement and description is the catchphrase for um, for what we do to catalog. Um, arrangement, putting things in order, description, um, you know, cataloging it and adding keywords, writing essays um, that explain what the collection means. Um, so how do we describe then um, this collection of folks whose identities were in flux? Um, I, I really appreciate the fact that Francis was here for this because uh, you have a very keenly developed sense of uh, privacy ethics and um, specifically surrounding transness. And uh, I don't know, let's talk about the fight we had. We, we didn't fight. <laughs> let's talk about the spirited debate we had. <laughs> I'm not sure it even, I'm not sure that I even put it, uh, put it that strongly, but it was a very good conversation. Um, and the, the, thing, the thing is, um, you know, trans, I think, I think that um, like name, names are one of the, 
you know, the ability to name ourselves and have our names respected is a, I'm not gonna say there's a universal trans experience, but there's a, that's certainly a very common one. And people have such a wide relationship of, like kinds of relationships to their names. And one of the things that I really did not want to do, like there, this, this struck me, um, so let me, let me back up a sec. The, the questions as we were putting together this finding aid. So the finding aid is publicly accessible. It's not currently indexed by Google, but um, you know, once, once something is on the internet, I'm going to assume that it's just out there on the internet. Um, so that means that the question of what to put, so there's the question of what to put in the aid. There's the question of accessibility. So if a, um, if a researcher is looking at Canadian trans history and they're looking at Nick Ghosh, they're maybe, maybe not going to know that this is the same person who um, shows up at, as Rupert Raj or Rupert, Ra Rupert Raj Gautier after his marriage. Um, so there's the question of, for, for researchers, how, how can, so there, there's the question of, of privacy. There's the, quest, there's the question of being known as you want to be. There's the question of how to present not just like a life, but a set of lives in a way that's going to make them accessible for other folks who are wanting to, um, who, who are trying to, you know, un understand them and present them to other folks. And so I think this is one of the things where there are so many competing concerns that there isn't necessarily a good answer. There isn't necessarily a right answer. There is possibly only a less wrong answer. And then even more than that, um, if you're listed in the FDM correspondence section of the finding aid, to my mind, that's roughly equivalent to putting a like putting a membership list <laughs> online, and and so there was the question of like is is even the fact of inclusion in this like how you know any 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 researcher can come to the archives and see the file the folders right so the names are there the materials there. There's no putting that particular cat back in the bag, but there is the question of how it's listed and kind of like how, what, what barriers to, um, to access there are and how it's presented. And I really want to underline what Francis said there about um, how so many archival decisions are about picking the best of several dubious options and just sticking with it and documenting the decisions that you made. Uh, so that future archivists and researchers can hold you accountable for it. Um, it's not just about making hard decisions, it's about saying, I Isaac Thelman made this decision, I'm sorry, or, <laughs> and here's why. Um, so what we, were, we were balancing all of these questions of, you know, how do you not out people? How do you also make sure that people can find the information that they need? Um, are you, by allowing somebody to remain you know, unknown, someone who Sullivan correspond to, corresponded with about trans masculinity. Um, are you, um, you know, are we contributing to uh, privacy or are we contributing to erasure? What we ultimately ended up doing, as Francis was saying, um, the names are on the folders and you can see them if you physically go in. Um, we did not put the names on the finding aid, but we did compile a list that's going to be available to people who ask um, and who are, you know, whose projects in, in, entail possibly knowing who, what everybody's names actually were. Um, and that's going to be available on demand, and in 50 years, it'll be put on the finding aid and all that information will be public. Can I, can I forget you, please? Um, the, let's see, I think, so, so there, there's, there's also the question, the question of changing names, right? So, yeah. 
So like for, for me personally, I kept my name. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to do that. So like I have I have no previous name. Other folks, like many, many other folks, want that want whatever name they were originally given to be gone, dead, buried, just out of out of knowledge. So with and some some of these correspondents went through multiple name changes also. There was one guy who changed his name like four or five times. So with all of that in mind, the list of names, so the, the, the list of the most recent name used on the correspondence will eventually in 50 years be included in the finding aid. That's a very con that's a conservative time because of not wanting to publicly out anyone who might not be out as trans by including on that list. We figure that if anyone is still alive at that time, that would be really impressive. Um, and we have a separate document which will be available to researchers that simply lists the names in the folders, which will not be available publicly because you know, because a lot of folks would like that name, to, like, be, because the set of relationships to names is, like, the feelings are so strong, and we hope that with the context that we've also provided for that list, hopefully people will at least be more cautious about um, how cavalier they will be with whatever they and um, hopefully they end up publishing the research. Yeah, and, and to such a large extent, this is just about cueing people into, uh, I don't want to say a set of social norms, but like letting them know. It is, it is. Yeah. These are, okay. these are our social norms. Legit, no, you're right. Um, so it is about, in many ways, uh, letting researchers know what's polite uh, through cues that we're giving ourselves. Um, I was just going to say, I really love the guy who changed his name several times. Uh, Lou writes him to say, please stop changing your name. I've been erasing it so many times in my address book that it's starting to get worn through the page. And it's, it's, such, a, it's such a loving statement. It's, it's really, yeah. Um, I, uh, we only have a couple more minutes. Um, I, I knew that we would end up talking about that for longer than we planned because it's fascinating. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to, Super rapidly, I want to talk about working with Louis Transman, though. Um, what is it like to do this, just just emotionally and in terms of um, the feels? Uh, I wanted to say um, that working with Louis materials has made me both more and less sentimental towards him. Um, I, I feel very tender towards his collection. Um, it, it's the only collection that I almost personify when I think about it. It's like, oh, we need to go get Louis. Somebody has called for him. And um, th there was a, a story that, um, it, this happened to me in the archives a few weeks ago, where uh, one of the Lou uh, boxes was, was out for a tour, uh, the one with the diaries in it, and uh, a volunteer was sitting next to it, just completely coincidentally, uh, playing the Beatles, uh, Lou's favorite band, he's an obsessive Beatles fan, and I just thought, oh, this is a strange moment of, of, of occupational therapy for people who are gone. Um, somebody's going to sit with you, with your collection in the archives, and play your favorite band. Um, yeah, it's it's been really fantastic for me to be able to like to get the chance to go through this all in so much detail. And there has been an element of um, I don't know, like the it feels coming from so many directions. There's the sort of like there, there's the conversations that we're still having. In various forms that um, you know from the newsletters and the correspondence and it's just sort of like oh I, we're, we're still talking about all of that and I guess probably will be for a while and then there's an element of the sort of kill your heroes like um, you know there were like there, there were aspects of transness and ways of being trans and showing up as, as trans that he didn't really get and then there's just the sort of like you know you're there's People are people, like the the thing where um, authors, where it's like authors don't respond to your negative reviews. You write a letter to the editor responding to one of the negative reviews for his book, and I'm just like, oh, oh, 
I really did that. <laughs> he really did that. <laughs> um, but but it's been it's been it's been really neat, and it's been really meaningful to um, like where where he was where he was um, really trying to dig into Jack Garland's life and in some sense do the sort of like look back and reading transness into someone who it is not really there where there just isn't nearly so much evidence about how he identified or like how he thought about himself um, we left us a lot of documentation and so I feel really lucky to be able to make these connections that's not reading into the sort of like well you know okay so this this person lived as a man but you know how, how did he feel about that we know how he felt about it yeah. and it's really delightful to be able to see that i i would definitely echo that uh, with lou we know we know everything um <laughs> sorry that wasn't intended as a joke, but, <laughs> and we also don't yeah but we know a lot um the last thing that i wanted to touch on here uh was just about all it, it's a related question but the experience of doing trans public history and at the same time watching Lou do trans public history, because of course uh, Lou was a historian um, by trade, if, if not by training. Um, and in addition to his secretarial work, he wrote a book about um, Jack B. Garland, who uh, was a, a transmasculine person uh, who lived, um, I haven't got his dates, uh, late Victorian era through the 30s, I want to say. And, um, Bob Davis is the founder and director of the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive in Vallejo, California. Uh, she served two terms on the GLBT Historical Society Board of Directors. She presented a talk, Glamour, Drag, and Death, How Two Com Community Archives Preserve Art from the Era of HIV and AIDS at the Archives, Museums, and Special Collections Queering Memory Conference in Berlin in June 2019. Uh, an article based on the talk will be included in the Trans and HIV slash AIDS issue of Transgender Studies Quarterly, uh, which is coming out later this year. Uh, Ms. Bob teaches music at Napa Valley College and City College of San Francisco. That was definitely my least favorite part of the evening. I hate hearing my own bio. <laughs> Which one's going to Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I'm the original OK Boomer. So uh, if this thing shows a different image than the one I'm talking about, let me know. <laughs> I'm a collector. And I say that in the same spirit as people who rise and come to the front of the room at 12 step meetings to confess long years of addiction <laughs> and abuse. Hi. My name is Ms. Bob. I'm Ms. Bob. And I'm a collector. <laughs> Turtles, newspaper clippings about comics. Newspaper clippings about Three Penny Opera, the musical. My mother would say anytime I had more than three of anything, it became a collection. <laughs> This collection I started the first time I had an apartment of my own mm -hmm. in 1979. First thing I bought was Female Mimics International Premier Issue. I still have it. <laughs> so that's Louise. Louise Lawrence was a local girl. She started living as a woman after her divorce at age 44. Actually, 1944. She was 32 years old. She lived as a woman without hormones, without surgery, without any medical intervention until her death in the early 1970s. She is a hidden founder of the transgender community as we know it. I don't know all the details. But I believe that she is one of the first transgender people who was paid for something other than sex. <laughs> she was in touch with Harry Benjamin, who was Christian Jorgensen's doctor, who also put her in touch with Keith Kinsey from the Kinsey Institute. And Kinsey hired her to interview drag queens, professional female impersonators, 
transgender women, transsexual women like herself. She would interview them, type up the interviews, and send them to Kinsey. And they're still there. There's 104, 114 folders of Louise's papers at the Kinsey Institute. Someday I'm going to still spend a week with Louise. She gave a presentation at the UC Med Center in San Francisco. It was attended by a 33-year-old PhD in chemistry named Arnold Lumley. He pestered her for a meeting and gave his name as Virginia Prince. Virginia Prince and Louise and two other trans women whose names I've forgotten at the moment put together the very first national transgender community publication in the late 1950s. They called it Transvestia. This is prior to Virginia Prince's January 1st, 1960 Transvestia. There's only about three issues of it. It's, um, but Louise's contact list, Louise's address book, served as the mailing list. Because Louise was an avid correspondent. Virginia Prince took her name. I've heard various stories. One was that Virginia lived on Prince Street when she was in Berkeley, when she lived in Berkeley and went to UC. The other is that she named it because that's where Louise lived, at the corner of Virginia and Prince in Berkeley. Now, when I put this talk together, most of the collection is still in storage. So what's here is very much by serendipity more than by plan. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's left out. One thing I did have access to was the photos of photo, my photography collection. So that's mostly what you're going to see are photographs. I've got a huge number, or Louise has a huge number, of theatrical impersonation. So I want to give you some theories of mine about theatrical impersonation. When you look at female impersonation, I see two archetypes. And I'm not the first one to think of this. There are uh, let me get Valentina and we'll go back. I call them Juliet and her nurse from Shakespeare. Juliet's young, Juliet's pretty, she's your ingenue. The nurse is older, the nurse is funny, the nurse is bawdy. This is the way she is in the play, and she has no name. She's simply called nurse. So when you look at <coughs> The wrong way. See, told you. So when you look at the Bigwood twins, this is Billy Bigwood and Ray Bigwood. Um, there are three photos of them in Louise's collection. They built themselves in vaudeville as impressions of this and that, or pep and personality. Um, those are not the real names. Uh, they changed them so they could act as the they performed as a brother act. And if you take a look at the photo here and look really closely, you'll see that they're in point. They're up on their toes. Uh, on the back of the photo, it says, Billy Bigwood and Ray Bigwood, parentheses, now dead, 1966. I have a number of photos that on the back side, someone's written something about Ray Bigwood. I believe I have some of Ray Bigwood's personal collection. Paul and Barber, also from Vaudeville, called themselves something old and new. They did singing, dancing, comedy, piano, and I must say, the flat-chested flapper look is very flattering for female impersonators. And I love those shawls. And those, now, in the old photos, they're really, really careful in trying to present a feminine image about how they looked and how they held their hands and feet. Look where his foot's pointing. Uh, Julian Elkins, who was famous piano person in Vaudeville, knew that if he held his hand this way in a photograph, it would look larger, but if he turned it to the side, it looked smaller, less of, a, less of a profile. So there's a lot of, if you look at the old photos, a lot of care taken with the hands. Now, so let's talk about, we've seen some, some, some Julians, let's see some nurses. Two old bags from Oakland, <laughs> <laughs> an act from Pinocchio's. These are the Ugly Sisters. The ugly, anyone here know the Ugly Sisters? There are two characters from the English pantom from the Christmas pantomime. They're probably equivalent to Cinderella's Ugly Stepsisters, and they're the comic act actresses in the in the shows. Um, 
This is Ray Francis and John Lotus. If you'll notice, Ray Francis, who was very, it was the short one, has her teeth out. And this act was stolen from a group called the Jewel Box Review, who was a traveling show of female impersonators. And they would then change the name to put city village. That'd be two old bags from Boise or two old bags from Washington or wherever they happened to be. All of these photos were collected by Harvey Lee. And he performed at the Jewel Box, performed at Finocchio's, and was a secretary by day at PG&E. Uh, a lot of Harvey's collection came to me after Harvey had died. It passed through two different people before it got to me. Harvey's papers, now Harvey had a massive collection of female impersonations. Female impersonators are adamant about the art of their performances. They consider it a real art. They will go on and on, and you can find writings where they go on for pages. <laughs> about how what we're doing is art, it's not like what you see on the streets. <coughs> Harvey destroyed his massive collection of friends of his garage. When Harvey died, he'd already arranged for the University of Arkansas, he's from Arkansas, at Little Rock, to come and get the collection. And so they did, they brought a truck, and then also Harvey's sister, who never approved, <coughs> came. And what I was told by Carmelita Nass, who was the lesbian, who was a friend of Harvey's, knew him from when he performed in New Orleans at the Mile Mile, and it was her garage that everything was stored in. So it was, they were taking things out of the garage and loading them into the back of the truck. Harvey's sister was taking them out of the truck putting some of them in the trash. And so after the truck left, Carmelita noticed that there was a box or two of photographs and materials in the trash. And that's when he spoke. That's how this stuff got here. We talk about an imperiled history. Um, now, if you look at male impersonation, Oh, by the way, the uh, idea of the Juliet and Romeo, uh, Juliet and the nurse, this is not unique to me. Uh, this uh, archetype has been noted by other scholars, especially when talking about minstrel shows, which were all male shows, but did have female impersonators in them, and uh, had, act, had usually the second act was a one-act play, and there would all the foolish parts be taken by men. So that's not unique. This is. Male impersonators. I think if you look at the archetypes of male impersonators, I see two. There's the authority figure and the lovable cat. <laughs> this is Vesta Tilly. This is a postcard. Uh, she was born in 1864. She began performing in boys' clothes when she was six. She was one of the highest paid performers in English musical. She appeared in World War I recruitment drives dressed as a sailor. And she sent the British off to World War I with songs like, Jolly Good Luck to the Girl Who Loves a Soldier, and The Army of Today is All Right. In 1912, she performed for Queen Victoria, becoming the first male impersonator to give a royal performance. She gave her female farewell performance at the London Coliseum on June 5th, 1920. And she, by that time, she'd been performing as a male impersonator for over 50 years. It was a standing room only crowd. They gave her 17 curtain calls. <laughs> and there had been a set of books traveling around with her when she did her farewell tour where her fans would write farewell wishes in them. At the end of the farewell final performance, she was presented with the books with over one million signatures of her fans. She was also Lady de Fries. She married royalty which I think was every actor's dream in those days. She has an autobiography and completely views her male impersonation as her job, her work, that's what she did. How it, if, it, if, it, if it was part of her psychology or her makeup, she didn't talk about it. And considering she died in 1920, there may have been considerable pressure not to. This is 
Bessie Cleveland. This is from the late 1800s, another postcard. One of the things about, especially this is true in dance, where there would be a pas de deux, you know, two dancers, a man and a woman, and the woman would take the man's part. Very often the re reason that these dancers were popular was because whoever played the man's part was much more exposed. You could see a lot more of the woman's body. So it's playing with the male audience. Take a look at that outfit. How much, remember, we're talking late 1800s. How much is, how much is left to the imagination? Let's look at some candies. I have 15 images of her wearing multiple outfits on multiple occasions. They're all in private. I call her my tall, thin girl. When you have someone who's dressing in private, on multiple occasions, in multiple outfits, I'm pretty sure that you're looking at someone who has some type of transgender identity, especially if they're documented with all these photos. I'm sure the 15 images I have are not the whole collection. But every once in a while, my tall, thin girl, there's a series of photos of her with a friend. Uh, this is an exterior shot, and they do what I've done myself. I don't have, I'm not showing you all the photos, but if you look, if, we had, if I showed them all, you would see that they change dresses, they switch outfits, they change wigs. That, you know, you can have my headdress if I can wear your dress. So there's a sense of community here. There's a sense of sharing. <coughs> then you get to one of photos like this. I love the American flags in the background. Jimmy and me. Okay, which one's Jimmy? On the left or on the right? Raise your hand if you think Jimmy's on the left. Your left. Raise your hand if you think Jimmy's on the right. I think Jimmy's on the left. I think Jimmy's wearing the suit. I think the suit fits Jimmy really well. <laughs> but because of where this is photographed, possibly, I'm not sure whether this is from some kind of community talent show or whether this is just how Jimmy dressed every day. So we get to the point in some of these candid photos where we, we can't be sure, especially if you only have one image to work from. I think that drag builds community. This text was written from, and this is an excerpt from my friend Gerard Koskovich, one of the people who also attended the founding meeting of the GLBT Historical Society. Uh, Gerard is a, makes his living as a rare queer bookseller. And I think if you, and a, and a, and a queer scholar, I think you take the words rare queer scholar and put them in any order, you'll have Gerard. Quote, flyer for the 1971 campaign of Jack Baker an openly gay law student running for student body president at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. The image plays on the stereotype of gay men as effeminate, effeminate and given to cross-dressing, a stereotype that Baker transforms into a mark of defiance and a proud symbol that his experience of difference is a source of strength. Baker and his life partner, parentheses, now husband, end parentheses, were the first same-sex couple in the United States to openly apply for a marriage license in 1970. When they were refused, they carried their fight to the United States Supreme <clears throat> Court in Baker versus Nelson, 1972. The court responded with a single sentence, quote, the appeal is dismissed for want of a substantial federal question, end quote. The case was cited extensively in the federal district court hearings and the appeals leading up to the 2015 Supreme Court decision that declared marriage equality a constitutional right. End quote. This is a copy of Virginia Prince's transvestite. She started in 1960. There's about 116 issues. She uh, edited the, and published the first 100. Um, the 100th issue is her royal biography, Life and Times of Virginia Prince. Um, this is Bobby, Bobby Thompson on the cover. 
Uh, I bought Bobby Thompson's collection, 13 boxes of it, from someone that Bobby shared an apartment with, uh, where they kept their drag and where they cross-dressed. Uh, Bobby was a member of the originally called um, Full Personality Expression, which is an organization that then became Society for the Second Self, and now it's called Tri-S. Um, and for the first, I don't know, maybe 30 issues, there was a cover girl. Starting out, she said it. And the cover girl would then write a short autobiography for the essay. Bobby's essay is called Bobby Goes Private. And in it, she says, quote, I can sum it up by saying, as a man, I exist. As a woman, I live. I don't stand up to give myself a break for twisting around, but what they were talking about earlier, about what do you, what do you tell people and what do you keep to yourself, even though you can find it in your archive? It's an issue I had dealing with these. I had the Bobby's collection and another collection of another uh, cross-dresser. Transvestite would be the name they would use then at this time. Because one of the things that came to me was Bobby's application to join Virginia Prince's organization. I have no idea why it's in the file. Maybe it's a rough trick. But it, it's very, very personal. I know her. I know, I know what they would call the name of her brother, right? Bobby's, you know, if you come with one of the S meetings, you change the meeting, and you come with a suitcase with your clothes in it. Maybe, I mean, the expression was, I've got my sister in the suitcase, right? So I know Bobby's name. I know her profession. I know all kinds of things about her. Now, let me give you a, a sense of how carefully these people protected their identities. When I first started, Corresponding through through a, a car, through a friend, I uh, found out that my friend found out that there's a collection for sale. Um, Betty Wharton had the collection, so I'm writing to Betty Wharton over a period of more than a year, talking about the collection, trying to get an inventory. You want me to give you twelve hundred dollars, and I don't know what you're giving me. Come on, <laughs> so I'm uh, trying to get an inventory list so I can evaluate. You know. What, what if it's all what, what if it's all played like Reagan means? What do I do with that? Um, so <clears throat> then at a certain point, Betty Wharton says, Well, call me Fred. That's my real name. It's okay, Fred. Now I'm ready to Fred Wharton. When it comes time to send the check, I make out the check to a different person with a different name at a, in a different town in the post office box, but to a street address. This is how many layers, even within the community, of protection that people used at that time. So even though you know Bobby Thompson's real name, and even though Bobby's now dead a good almost 30 years, according to what I was told, how much of that information do you share? Where do you draw the line? I, I do it on a case by case. I don't know that I'll ever tell anyone Bobby's real name. I don't see any purpose. But when the collection goes to someone else, who knows? Um, let me go on. This is a photo from Bobby's collection. This is her friend Sheila. I also know Sheila's profession. But Sheila wrote about her profession. She was the literary editor for Transvesti. And she wrote about her profession in Transvesti. I know that she was a scientist. I believe a, bio, a, a, a biochemist. Okay, so, and when this photo, I, I ran this photo in uh, Transgender, uh, Transgender Monthly, which uh, was in a, a four or five years of publication in the 90s. They put it out in the Transgender Community News. And I ran this in a couple of other Christmas photos. And I said, look, we don't know. There may be another half dozen or dozen queens sitting in the background, sipping eggnog, waiting for their chance to get their photo taken. And I was right. These photos were taken with Casa Susanna, which was the Catskill Resort run by Susanna Valente and her wife Marie, where on certain weekends, people, transgender people, could come up and live in this 10 or so acre area in their gender of choice. Uh, Harvey, Harvey Feierstein wrote a play about it called uh, Casa Valentina. Um, and here's Sheila and Bobby 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's Jeanette. Now, look, this is, this is her Christmas card. And look at the difference. So many of these photographs of trans women at this time are in anonymous motel rooms with the drapes drawn. There's Bobby and Shield together. One thing I've been really interested in lately is newspaper photographs. Getting the real photos from the newspapers. You can find them online. I'll give you a small sample here of some of the stuff I've got. Some stuff I've been able to pick up. Let me give you some background for this. Um, the Anita they're talking about is Anita Bryant. She was a beauty queen, second runner-up to the Miss America pageant. In the mid-70s, she was spokesman for the Florida Citrus Commission and appeared on TV singing about oranges. And she, her, her uh, tagline for this ad campaign was, breakfast without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. Well, she led a Christian right campaign in 1977, to overturn an ordinance in Florida, where's the name? Dade County. Dade County. Thank you, thank you, Ruth. Uh, Ruth Mahaney, a uh, wonderful historian and much more knowledgeable than I. Um, she led the campaign, she was the face of it, and the idea was to overturn this ordinance that prohibited sexual discrimination. And the tagline was, save the children. Well, they were successful by the two to one margin. It, it, it failed. I mean, the ordinance was, was declared null and void. And they decided to take the campaign national. This is on our left there, the taller fellow, is Danny Bryant, Anita's husband. On the right is Perry Desmond. On the back of this, now one thing about these that's so cool, oops, I don't have it here. But besides, see, it gives you all the information. On the back, they give you little pieces of information. They clip out something from the newspaper and paste it on the back so they have a reference to the photo. So on the back, it says May 18th, 1977, from the state's item by Ronald Litt. I don't even know the rest of this for a while. I'm going to photocopy Now, Perry was discharged from the Navy and thrown out of college and had a divorce because he was gay. He became a female impersonator, worked with the Jewel Box Review, which I mentioned earlier, and started living full time as a woman. Had hormones, sexual reassignment surgery, and was miserable. Considered suicide. Then he became born again, and wrote this book, A Transformed Transsexual, and he became a minister. And here, they're advocating for <coughs> We're behind Anita, and we want her in New Orleans. We think people should band together and stand up for her. If we will not allow Anita in New Orleans because of her religious beliefs, then we could keep Oral Roberts or Billy Graham or any other person out of the city. The group was trying to get, quote, Christians to write to the summer pops, just like here. Here, here stands for Human Equal Rights, which is the name of the organization. And they're trying to support Anita Bryant because the gay community was protesting the fact that she had been booked to sing at the summer festival. There, there's the back of the photographs. You can see, they give you some, they give you the photo, you see who you got, and you get some information as well. This is Diane Cannon. This photo is from the Associated Press News Service. It was for use on Sunday, November 9th, 1980. The caption, the title of the article was, She's a Male, by Chris Roberts. Diane Cannon, 26, born Anthony, serving two and a half years for escape, assault, and theft. Quote, I'm caught in between. Before prison, I had partial sex change operation that was on a heavy dose of female hormones. End quote. While she was in jail, the transition had been suspended, quote, from the article, until society's death is paid. They still have something to go back? No. 
This is Todd A. Asse. Uh, this photo ran three times, according to the footage on the back, uh, in the uh, Portland newspaper. June 14th, 1989, August 29th, 1989, November 14th, 1989. Todd Alexander Assay, six foot two, lived in southwest Portland, worked as a female impersonator, quote, at an old town nightclub, end quote. Last seen on May 26th, 1989, about 3 a.m. near Southwest Stark Street and 12th Avenue, last seen wearing a red wig, black tank top, and green designer jacket. It was obviously shot from a snubber photo. They blew this up. You can see it looks like another man has his arm around Todd. That's what we know about Todd. That's all. Now, a historian could go find the police records, could see if there's someone who knew Todd from 1989, maybe even find the arresting officer or the DA. But that's not my job. My job is to bring these things together and make this material accessible to the community so that people can understand not only that we have a history, but what that history was like and the difficulties we had going through it. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, last of all, uh, this evening, I would like to invite Ellis Martin and Zach Osma to come up and read from their collection of Lou Sullivan's diaries. Um, excerpts thereof, I should say, it's less than a quarter of them. Uh, we both laughed with pleasure. Um, so Ellis works with digital der derivatives in the interstice. I cannot pronounce that word. I have two degrees in speaking English, ladies and gentlemen, and other folks, <laughs> I'm very sorry, of art and archives. He holds a BA in Visual and Critical Studies from Mills College. He edited We Both Laughed in Pleasure, The Selected Diaries of Lou Sullivan, with Zach Osma, and has generated large-scale digitization projects at Mills College Art Museum, the Oakland Museum of California, the John J. Wilcox Jr. Archives, and the GLBT Historical Society. Um, Zach is a poet, potter, and social practice artist who uses embodiment theory, archival research, and neoclassically gay imagery to inform his practice. Um, employing the Mises, pedagogy, humor, surprise, and reward. He works in a variety of materials and media, including ceramics, found objects, performance, writing, and works on paper. He is the author of Black Dog Drinking from an Outdoor Pool and co-edited uh, We Both Left in Pleasure with Ellis. He holds a BFA in community arts from California College of the Arts in Oakland. Come on up. CCA friends will know that I put California College of the Arts in Oakland. <laughs> um, this is so good. There's so many people here. Thank you for coming here. Um, Ms. Bob, that was so wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you so much, Isaac and Frances, for talking about, um, you know, your considerations and also just the update on what's going on with Lou. Um, Isaac, when you said that it's the one archive that you tend to personify, um, that you talk about taking people to visit Lou. That's something that Ellis and I have been saying for a very, very, very long time. Um, like, originally when I started working with the collection, it was on loan to the San Francisco Public Library. And I would, like, you know, have a friend come to town and say, oh, do you want to go visit Lou at the library? And then our, our standing weekly meeting that we've been having for, like, two and a half years at this point is called the calendar events called Visiting Lou. So I thought that was sweet. Um, we're gonna read some stuff. Early Saturday morning, we take off north of the city. Bridget, Charlie, Jake, Brian, Kathy and Cheney, Mary, Rusty, Buddy and I. I had gone after work Friday to a swank gay men's clothing store on Castro and finally bought myself a new pair of swim trunks. And I looked beautiful. I look beautiful in it. We got a place about 60 miles north called Sugarloaf State Park or something, and set up camp. I complained there was no swimming and found out about a swimming area nearby. I was the fun Uncle Lou and watched Buddy playing Frisbee with Jake, Bree, and Chaney while the rest of them put the campsite together. I felt very independent, 
traveling light, only having to worry about my own care, not a family's. We all laid in the sun, and when we got bored, piled in the car and went to the swimming hole. Spring Lake, do you believe it? It was perfectly beautiful. Roped off shallow area for the kids, rent inner tubes, paddle boats, no problem with drinking, smoking, or playing music. It was perfect. I watched the young men, and I felt so attractive, even though I still have to put tape over my scars to keep the sun off them. Who cares anyway? I was still one of the best looking guys around. Mary Ellen and Kathy both sincerely told me how cute I was, and Kathy said, if she were a girl, we laughed. She'd be eyeing me up. Then Rusty pointed out to me the four gay men just behind us on the beach. They were older guys, not being blatant, but definitely two pairs of lovers. Thereafter, I put on a little show for them, and they watched me as I pranced around, sunning myself, oiling myself, combing my hair, <laughs> toweling dry. So we started cooking up the food and doing quiet things alone. I sat under a nearby tree and read Mary Renault's charioteer. So far a little disappointing in the lack of its physical affection, contact. It was about that time that Rusty started calling me my man, my main man, as he fired up a joint for us a term he seems to use only for his very close buddies. Well, we were all a smoking and a drinking, and we all ate and started playing tapes on my recorder, dancing and a singing, even little buddy was out there. In the morning, I wake up to birds chirping above my head. It was dewy out, but already warming. This was an open bed truck. And next campsite to ours is a very beautiful, nearly naked male torso sunning himself in the morning light. I played along, stripping down to my swim trunks and laying on the side of the truck on my back. There were four, I believe, obviously gay guys, all primping and stretching and sunning. I thought, we have always been here. I always wondered where we were. We'll get there. Look, it's the purple, the purple one. There's a lot of notes in this book. <laughs> How many? We got it. Thank you. We were walking down Broadway, and I saw him, and couldn't resist taking hold of him from behind, tickling him as I had done before. But this time there happened to be some broad there from one of the strip joints, and he got pissed she saw. He shoved me off and warned, leave me alone, Lou. I'm a real macho guy, Lou. I looked at him incredulously. I seem to do that a lot, hey, and said, you're really a macho guy? I just shook my head. Later he says to me, Lou, I like you. I just like you. I don't love you or anything. I said back to him, you told me you loved me. After being initially startled, he got that intellectual look and said, sometimes I just say things because they seem right at the moment. I talked to Dan a little, trying to cool down. Then I turned to T and said, man, don't talk shit to me. Don't tell me shit. He knew what I meant, too. He put his head on my face, and he laid the palm of his hand on my cheek and said, Lou, don't start freaking out. And the warmth of his touch quieted me. Earlier in the evening, I had jostled him around affectionately, and he responded, saying, be rough with me, Lou. I like that. I said, yeah, I do, too. He's wearing a St. Christopher's medal. I tried to take it out of his shirt twice, but he kept stuffing it in. I remember Bo. I remember his gold chain. He reaches out for me now, but I still must express my desire for him first. Surely his face is God's. I look into his eyes and I feel that I've seen God. And then he'll meet my eyes and smile, taking me even higher. We walked around the Tenderloin into several dirty bookstores. He says it's a funny thing, but in those stores he doesn't get turned on by pictures of cunts. Just the opposite, he said. You like the cocks? He nodded with resignation. I felt strong and proud in my old neighborhood, showing him the hot spots. I appeared with Paul Walker on the San Jose TV show on transsexualism. 
I understood San Francisco could not get the station, but they do. Yet, I figured it out, I figured it was a long shot that anyone would see it there. Yesterday, a woman at Bechtel, who was the secretary then, I've had lunch with and been friendly with approached me, saying, some, saying someone had seen a Lou, Lou Sullivan on TV, and was it me? I denied the whole thing. She was very freaked out by it and said she knew it couldn't possibly have been me because she knows I'm not that weird, etc. I assured her that it wasn't, but could, but could feel sweat forming on my forehead. She left, but I called her back, asking the name of the person who had seen the show. She wouldn't tell me, saying she'd talk to the person and tell them to quit spreading lies about me. Yesterday, T and I rode our bikes to Golden Gate Park. T was leading me through the hidden paths and trails. I found a secluded spot and laid on the grass. He told me he wished he could introduce me to his family and be open with them about us. But he knew he never could, that he had always strived to be what they expected him to be, especially his mom. He said he felt that way even if, he, if I were a normal man and we were together, so I don't feel too bad. Then he asked me if I have any problems with our relationship, and I said yes. I wish he'd turn off the iron by the switch instead of pulling it out by the cord. <laughs> <laughs> Telling him in that way how content I am. He pressed me further, and then I said, never tell him how, I, then I said I never tell him how I feel about him. I couldn't believe it, and so I never, so I tried my best to express to him how much he means to me. He said he wanted to read my diary, because it would tell him how I feel about him. We ended up having loving sex there in the grass, each masturbating each other to orgasm. He says he can, see, he can see I'm holding back sometimes, and I admitted it, of course I am, when he continues to tell me how he wants a different relationship, one with a woman, because he feels like he should, that not that he wants it. He gave me a transistor radio for my birthday so I could listen to it at night like I used to on Blue Mountain Road. He also took a self-portrait of me and developed one of the photos he took of me on the roof of 17th Street for when we, when we first knew each other. Jay phoned me for my birthday, telling me he's finally got a job in Japan, something he's dreamed of for several years. He was leaving at the end of the month to teach English to Japanese businessmen and housewives. I'm happy for him, him but feel a little melancholic. I think of Janae, who wondered what two beautiful men thought when they faced each other. I gather each tidbit, each lead I pursue as though I'm finding someone with whom I'm in love. Jack Garland is my dad. The coroner's report said that he had cancer of the liver and spleen. When I first read it, I thought it said she had iron gray eyes, but today I looked closer and it said brown eyes and iron gray hair. She had hair like an old man. I think of dad's beautiful white box. Wasn't even going to the California Historical Society a second time, but I found out today the first visit, I found, because I found out today they didn't have anything. <laughs> but wanted to see if they had any newspapers missing from the libraries. They didn't, so I aimlessly wandered through the newspaper file and saw there was an index to a San Francisco paper from from 1896 to 1903. So there's been no indices to the newspapers. I just had to go, I just had to go view the microfilm aimlessly to happen on an article on her or about her. I like to call him her because it reminds me of me when I first came from and how lucky I am. How Jack Garland wanted to be Jack Garland. I wonder if, I, if I'd have had the strength to live full time as a man before the, the luxury of hormones and surgery. I feel I want to have all the surgery to go all the way in memory of Jack Garland. The index had one article on her, I did it. Described a story on Babe Dean with portrait. It's another name for Jack Garland. Of course, when I looked up the newspaper reference, the article wasn't there, so now I'm following another lead. I know there's another article with more precious information and a portrait, not just a cut as they describe the line drawings. Tomorrow I'm going to go to an all day, T asks, all gay, workshop on how to get your book published conducted by a literary agent here in San Francisco. <laughs> They've been recommended to me twice. Called Tris, Chris, who's another F to M gay, gay man who moved here recently from Cleveland and is my age, and who's trying to get his stuff published. And he wants to go too. I'm gonna go get this book on Jack published.
Thank you so much for coming.